Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to check out the Hornet King channel. This is the removal of an eastern yellow jacket colony that had made its nest underneath the stepping stone here at a client's house. This was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is just on the outer suburbs of Philadelphia, not quite in the city. So this particular colony was nested underneath this stepping stone and the client had actually gotten stung a couple times before noticing they were even there. Um, so when I arrived, I just set up my vacuum and just start sucking up as many of the foragers, workers, and guards as I could. Pounding on top of the rock, it kind of gets them all stirred up and uh, it starts letting them flood out from that entranceway to, uh, to investigate what the pounding was. Um, so as they start coming out, I start vacuuming them up. So you'll kind of notice that the, um, the ones that, that are crawling out, that aren't flying out, they're difficult to get vacuumed up. And uh, it has nothing to do with the power of the vacuum as much as it has to do with the fact that they have hooked feet. And those hooked feet can pretty much latch onto any surface, um, even as smooth as you might think it is. Um, and on the microscopic level, these surfaces aren't all that smooth. So their feet are able to hook on there and really take hold. When I vacuum up, I, I try to get the ones flying, so that's why I pound more onto the stone. So that way it gets them flying and stirred up, and then when they fly out in midair, they get sucked up into the vacuum. Um, but the ones that are crawling, I have to sit there and constantly swipe my vacuum nozzle back and forth and back and forth. So in this particular colony, there's probably about, I don't know, maybe 1,000 to 1,500 adults inside. It was a good-sized colony, um, and that's including larvae, pupating adults, Queen, um, hatched queens, workers, guards, males, all of them. It includes everybody. So once I pick up the rock, I was able to locate the nest pretty easily. Um, oftentimes underneath these flat rocks, moles and voles will dig tunnels that go directly underneath of the, uh, the rock surface, and that will allow for, uh, for, for it to be like an exposed top half of the tunnel, almost like a half pipe. So it's probably what this an original queen, when she founded this area, that's probably what she probably attached the top of her nest to that rock. Um, and then as the colony built bigger and bigger and bigger, they just kind of expanded out the soil around that original tunnel, and now you can't even see the tunnel anymore. So I just try to dig up as much as I can, um, excavating out around the colony um, and around the nest, and try not to disturb it all too much, because the more I disturb it, the more that are going to come out unnecessarily. So if I could keep them inside the layers of comb uh, for as long as possible, that's less I have to vacuum up, or that's you know, less of a chance that they're going to swarm all around me. The more that swarm, the longer I have to stay there vacuuming up adults. So if I can try to be as gentle as possible, if that means take a little bit more time vacuuming and digging up um, the actual nest, that's what I do. So I was able to get a couple good angles of this removal. Oftentimes when I do my ground nest, the, the camera's kind of on like a 30 degree angle from where the nest is. Um, but this time I was able to get the, the camera just above it so that way you can see how much gap there is around the nest. So when they're building, they don't build the envelope directly to the um, inside wall of the, of the hole. They actually leave a little bit of a gap in between. And that's so they can climb on the outside and build more envelope and will also be able to climb out on the outside and dig um, more soil out. So there's always a good amount of, uh, there's probably about a half inch, three eighths to a half inch of gap around the nest. So as the workers dig and they dig out the cavity for the nest to be built into, um, any rocks that are in there they're not able to dig out so they kind of just dig around them and chew, chew the soil off of the stones and then carry that dirt out and then the rocks themselves drop to the bottom of the hole. Um, so oftentimes when I'm done, after I pull the nest out, you'll see a collection of stones at the bottom and that's where like the new queens and the males kind of hide underneath all that, uh, hide underneath all those pebbles and things. So this is a good sized nest. This had a lot of uh, new uh, queen cells in it. Most of the top ones that you see there, the two comb patties are all queen cells. So all those silk caps are going to become new queens, which is pretty phenomenal because there was a lot of queens in this colony already. If you look in between the layers, you'll see the actual queen. Third, third layer down, you can see her crawling there. 
So I keep as many in, the, in between the comb layers as possible and put that in my Rubbermaid bin, then I'll worry about sucking them up once I get home. So you see there's a lot of males at the bottom there. You can tell the males because they have a longer ram horn-like antenna. Females have the, uh, the straight, shorter antennae, and they kind of shoot straight out in front of them, but the males, they just kind of hook around. I call it ram horns because they, they kind of make that same shape. So after sucking up some of the envelope, you see how many are at the bottom underneath of that envelope. And most of those are males, and there's some queens in there too. So there's one founding queen at the beginning of a season. So all of this was started by one individual queen. Um, but then as the season progresses, uh, the workers start building more larger cell comb, which become the queen cells. So then when the queen lays eggs in there, um, those, one, those larvae gr can grow bigger and demand more food, and the more food they get, the larger they get, and then that's how they develop their um, reproductive system, by being a larger larva being fed more nutrition. So filling back in the hole, the client actually gave me a bag of soil, topsoil that she had lying around, so I was also able to fill that in with that. Careful when you're punching the inside of a hole like this, there was a rock jutted out the side of that, and I punched it right with my fist. I got nothing for you, squirrel. I got nothing for you, squirrel. We'll have some larvae soon. No larvae yet. This isn't a really good time, Humphrey. I'm about to do some wasp nests. So after I get the nest home, I try to vacuum up as many of the adults as I can. I'm not too worried about ones that straggle and fly away. It's not a big deal. They're not going to hurt anything. They'll just go off and die. Um, so I just kind of take my time, try not to bang the, the, the bin too much, try not to jostle anything around because then all of them are going to come out all at the exact same time and nobody needs that happening. So. Uh, once I get the nest out of the bin here, I take my pry bar and I just separate the layers of comb one piece at a time. But again, being gentle not to like flop the nest around or whatever. Um, Eastern Yellow Jackets make a kind of more of a brittle type envelope, so I just kind of take my vacuum nozzle and just kind of scrape it on the back of the comb and that stuff just breaks apart and it goes right up into the nozzle. This is where a lot of the males and things like to hide, um, so I try to get that vacuumed up as quick as I can. Separating the comb layer here, you notice that there's not too many at this top layer. These are just queen cap cells. So there's not too many larvae in there either. So there's not really much reason for anybody to be hanging out up there. So just a few, a few males really that I just have to vacuum up. I love the noise that that makes when you back when you pry it open because then it's like it like crunches and carries on. A lot of males in this nest. There's an egg queen. Lots of males. Holy cow. Spent a few more minutes here just vacuuming up the last few. Let's look at that nice cluster down there. So there was a lot amount of queens at this bottom part of this comb. There's a queen, a lot of queens here. So there would have been a lot of new colonies started from this particular colony if I hadn't uh, removed it, which I'm sure they're are gonna start anyway around my house because as you can see, some, <laughs> some queens are jumping off the table. So I just let them go. I'm not worried about queens. I hope that they do start a nest nearby so I can film them next year. Haven't found the queen yet.
So I was able to get some super detailed macro shots using my video microscope of the wasps themselves. So you're able to see all their body structures, all the hair on their body, how they breathe out of their abdomen, their mouth parts, their legs and their hooked feet, and their wings, plus shots of the comb and the envelope and how it's made, plus some shots of the larva eating up close and personal. The wasp that I was able to use was a European Hornet Queen, a Bald Faced Hornet Queen, and a Southern Yellow Jacket Queen. Check it out. I was really excited to share these macro images with you guys using my video microscope. I'm able to show the vast intricacies of these creatures and just what makes them tick. The abdomen here of a southern yellow jacket queen and seeing how it opens up at the end to allow for the ovipositor to come out is really bizarre of it because some of them just have a straight hole in the middle and this one you can see that it kind of opens up on the back side. This is the wing of a southern yellow jacket queen. It looks just like cellophane. It's kind of like a, a bat wing made out of cellophane. Seeing the hair on the back of her head and the back of her thorax moving down to her shoulder and where her wing connects into her shoulder. And seeing all the black vein that you can see going through the cellophane-like material of her wing. And that's not dirt on her wing, that's just the color of it, it's just the way it looks. I always wonder why it had that little bit of a, like a tannish look about it, and it's because it has all this fleck inside of it. I mean, there is some particulate on there, but the main, like, tannish color, like the goldish color hue that it has, that's not from dirt, that's just the way it looks. This is the back of a southern yellow jacket queen. These are the distinct markings that I look for when I'm identifying a species. And then the three little simple eyes on the back of her head, along with the large almond shaped eyes. These are the mandibles and mouth parts of a bald faced hornet, Delica vespula maculata, or an aerial nest building yellow jacket. See the beads of water at the tips of her hair on the front of her face. Her antennae and her compound eye and look at all the little hexagonal shapes on her eye incredible detail it's so interesting to see these guys this close you see her hooked feet her mandibles and her mouth parts in behind the abdomen of the bald-faced hornet you can see it's like telescopic and that's how they breathe those telescopic segments move in and out and that allows for air transfer in through her um, ovipositor port into her abdomen and all the little gold hairs that attach to the very ends of the telescopic segments of her abdomen. See her hooked feet, back legs, back side of her mouth parts. Just love this shot and you're able to see like her chest and how her legs connect in, how she has like a reverse elbow coming from each one of her legs and that way she can do this and touch her face with her legs. These are the hooked feet that she has. So when I say that the wasps have hooked feet and they can attach to anything, this is what they look like. These two like talon looking things and they're very, very hard. It's exoskeletons, not hair. And they're able to grip surfaces with them. And primarily their nest is so perforated, these little hooks can kind of like hook into the perforations on the nest. And they have like these little spurs like a little ways up from those tines and they're able to connect in even with those if their leg lays flat on the surface. Just zooming in and out so you can see the different segments. So this is the cellulose. This is what the envelope looks like really, really close up. I don't know what time zoom this is. I just had the video microscope really, really close to the nest so you can see all the different fibers of the envelope. And that shine is not wet. That's, that nest isn't wet and it's not an overly sharpened image. That's the way it looked in the video. That's the way it looked through the lens. So when they mold that into a paste and make that envelope, it almost like solidifies into like a cement. It's really crazy. So all those little strands you're seeing are individual cellulose strands that they pulled off of a piece of wood. And every stripe is indicative of one wasp laying one strip at one time. close-up shots of some larvae. These are what the cells look like up close. They're not as perfect as you might think they are. They're fringed at the top and they're not quite perfectly hexagonal. They're sometimes a little bit cylindrical. 
They're focusing too on these two larvae here, the yellowish ones. There's a white one kind of down in the back there that's a, a juvenile larva. Uh, but these two larvae here in the front, um, the one is starting to prep for the silk cap to be put on, and the other one's dealing with a silk cap or silk string that she that she must have uh, produced and is getting ready to attach it to the side. that one going hard at work prepping her site. So I gave him a little bit of food and watch how she sucks it right up. Right into the gob. <laughs> so cool to see that up close. Squirrel. Oh, squirrel, squirrel. Oh, squirrel, squirrel. Hey, turkey. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, tail's so fluffy, squirrel, squirrel. Yeah, I'm just done with that because I gotta go feed the chickens. <clears throat> Are you camera shy, Squirrely Squirrel? Hey, you Squirrely Squirrel! And here's yummy sunflower tea, Squirrely Squirrel! Look at those nipples, Squirrely Squirrel! Look at the nipples you have! I never know a squirrel that has such big nipples! <laughs> <laughs> 